men. Okay. Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you today. We thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing us. We thank you for Jesus' example. For even when he was on this earth and he faced the deadliest disease then known, he did not fear to go to those that had this disease to show to them your character. Help us to have the strength that we need. Guide us now. Direct us so that we may learn. So that when things begin to look dark, that we will have faith in you. For this we thank you. For this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. At the close of yesterday's study, I gave an assignment. How many of us chose to read the assignment? Yeah. Okay. I got part of it wrong, read. Okay. Now, one of the, one of the things that that has been being presented and that we have been addressing is we need to be searching our Bibles as did Father Miller. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to give my personal opinion that that means that I also need to be searching the spirit of prophecy in the same manner looking line upon line at each situation because there are going to be a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe a small diamond, maybe, maybe a vein of gold in different areas of the spirit of prophecy. And then I compare that with scripture. So part of what we're going to do today is we're going to be looking at this from Christ Object Lessons, but we're also going to look at a couple of other documents. And I will be putting these other documents up on the screen as we begin to go through them. We're going to be comparing this to see if we find items within the assigned portion of the reading and within these documents that may help to expand our understanding of what's going on. So with that in mind, I'm gonna share the screen. I'm pulling up one document, but we're going to start reading from Christ Object Lessons. And I'm gonna give you the pages as we begin, okay? Sure. Now, Christ Object Lessons, page 411, paragraph 2, which was not part of the reading, but occurs just before what was assigned. Now, what's up on the screen right now is also in reference to the Ten Virgins, but we're going to be looking at both of these. So one I'm going to be reading from, and then I'm going to refer back to this other document. So from Christ Object Lessons. This is the class that in time of peril are found crying peace and safety. They lull their hearts into security and dream not of danger. When startled from their lethargy, they discern their destitution and entreat others to supply their lack. But in spiritual things, no man can make up another's deficiency. The grace of God has been freely offered to every soul. The message of the gospel has been heralded. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 17. But character is not transferable. No man can believe for another. No man can receive the spirit for another. No man can impart to another the character 
which is the fruit of the Spirit's working. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Ezekiel 14.20. Now we're going to use that paragraph to set the table for everything else. The next paragraph, first paragraph of the assigned reading. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation. Now a sudden and unlooked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation, when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. So, from these words, what can we discern about this time of the ten virgins? Something is going to be life threatening. So okay. Good morning, Patrick. Uh, you're um, you're not coming through very clearly. Sorry, I never come through very clearly. Okay, so I'm going to read this sentence again. So now, a sudden and unlooked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. What does Mrs. White mean by this? What do you take it to mean? Well, I think, Dwight, that is just what I was ranting about. <laughs> I've come face to face with death. We are always face to face with death. Okay. And we realize that DARPA has invented, and you know, Gates and all these teams have invented these things that are on the surface, they look totally deadly, that they're going to succeed with their call, but nevertheless, some of us will be able to survive. Taking the words directly as she wrote them, a sudden and unlooked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any faith in the promises of God. Now, I read this, the church has for years looked for a Sunday law. Yet Mrs. White calls this time period a sudden and unlooked for calamity. Is this Sunday law, as the church has been presenting it, is it unlooked for? Or would this be referring to something else? seeing okay. more of an individual application because the church on your right has been looking for the Sunday law for generations. Okay, Stephen, was that you? No, it was it was me. I was saying that I I think it's um it's something uh as Patrick was pointing out, something more individual, something that that it happens in our lives from sometimes day to day, sometimes month to month, whatever. It was used to uh, build our faith in the Lord or bring us to the point of deciding, do we, do we decide for the Lord on this case or do we take it on our own? Okay. 
Patrick, Chris, thank you. The 10 virgins are watching in the evening of this earth's history. All claim to be Christians, all have a call, a name, a lamp, and all profess to be doing God's service. All apparently wait for Christ's appearing, but five are unready. Five will be found surprised, dismayed, outside the banquet hall. Now going to the document that's on the screen. The parable of the 10 virgins is given to represent the church. Those who are watching for their Lord's appearing, those who are seeking most earnestly to be among that number who will be acknowledged as the lamb's wife. All the 10 virgins are apparently happy, full of joyous hope and anticipation. Apparently, there is no difference between the five who are wise and the five who are foolish. To outward appearance, they are all prepared, robed in white, and are carrying their lighted lamps, which represent the oil of truth. But the virgins did not expect to wait so long. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. They all made efforts to keep awake, but they ceased to speak often to each other. And when the call came, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. It was unexpected. Now, in these two documents, Mrs. White has written that all of the virgins are watching in the evening of Earth's history. What does that say to you? Being close to the time of the end, the final calamity, the final crisis. How do we record? How how do we regard? the time when we're when we're hearing of the evening is this the beginning or the ending of the day end of the day how would we say that from scripture i mean if we if we were looking at at the book of genesis wouldn't genesis say that the evening and the morning are the first day Yes. Okay. So if we are in the evening, are we not looking forward to the day that is to come? So if this is in the evening of Earth's history, that means that we should be anticipating the day that is to come and giving praise because that day is soon to be upon us. We should be aware of that point. Going back to Christ object lessons. At the have, final, yes, please. Yeah, I was just thinking of the, the parable. Yes. And Matthew 20. Yes. You have the the people that go out to work in the vineyard throughout the day. Yep. So the evening would be like around the 11th hour. I would think around that time of history. Okay. And concerning the parable, how, how would that, how would you, would you have that in mind as well? Well, what I, what I would have in mind as the Savior has pointed out, that we cannot be working in the night, that we work during the day while it is light. We're coming to a point where Earth's history is about to close. It is in the evening of the Earth's history. And I've had that in my mind. But 
we also have the day that is to come so that when the evening is past, we see the dawn that is soon, soon to be upon us. As we look at these things, as we go through these, these documents and in these lessons that Mrs. Fight has left for us, we need to be looking to the positive portion. There are going to be those that are going to be scared of what's going on. When we hear the, the message, fear God, there are a lot of people that, that take fear to truly be afraid of God. But we are to fear God. We are to give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Which is the three angels message and which John has described as the everlasting gospel. So continuing. At the final day. Many will claim admission to Christ's kingdom, saying, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? But the answer is, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me. In this life, they have not entered into fellowship with Christ. Therefore, they know not the language of heaven. They are strangers to its joy. What man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.11 Saddest of all words that ever fell on mortal ear are those words of doom. I know you not. The fellowship of the spirit, which you have slighted, could alone make you one with the joyous throng at the marriage feast. In that scene, you cannot participate. Its light would fall on blinded eyes, its melody upon deaf ears. Its love and joy would awake no chord of gladness in the world benumbed heart. You are shut out from heaven by your own unfitness for its companionship. These are very serious words. Yes, they are. Notice that Mrs. White does not write in the third person she's writing this in the second person. She's giving it as a direct warning to the reader. This is something that she took seriously enough to warn us about well over a hundred years ago. At the call, behold, the bride and groom cometh. All the virgins arose and looked to their lamps. Five of the number commenced to set their lamps in order. These lamps were small and held but a small quantity of oil. And the wise virgins had provided themselves vessels containing oil. Thus, five lamps were burning brightly to relieve the darkness of midnight. But five were standing surprised and alarmed. They had become aware of the fact that they had no oil for their vessels and which to replenish their lamps. They had no light and they stood in the darkness, desolate and despairing. Then they set forth the cry, give us of your oil for our lamps have gone out. This terrible situation they now see to be the consequence of their own carelessness. And they plead with the five wise virgins for a supply of oil. 
but the waiting five with their freshly trimmed lamps have emptied their vessels. They have none to spare. And the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough and for you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking when the cry is heard. Behold the bridegroom. And then gathering up our empty lamps to have them replenished. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. In the parable, the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps. Their light burned with undimmed flame throughout the night of watching. It helped to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honor. Shining out in the darkness, it helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom to the marriage feast. One of the, one of the points that became very clear to me as I had studied and was led to study in the, in the messages of Jones and Wagner was that the reason that Christ had not returned before this has been that the bride has not made herself ready. Several years ago, I presented this in with a small group. And it was interesting to me to see that those within this small group, even though they professed to be Christian and to be understanding of the messages that were going out, could not grasp the concept that the bride had refused to make herself ready. In this situation, the 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish, five were ready for the emergencies that might come. They were prepared and five were not. So the following, yes, please. I was just going to comment that um, I think sometimes we, myself, have uh, been unclear about what it meant to get ready, to be ready. Um, you know, you can prepare for, for an event, you know, clothes, shoes all the things you need for that event. But this, this event is not, is talking about what's in the heart more than what's in, the, in your communication relationship with the Lord more than it is. I guess that can be a metaphor of what you wear as well. But, it, but it's deeper to me, it's deeper than just worrying about the surface things, how you look, how, whether somebody sees you in, in some place you shouldn't be or some place you're embarrassed that they found you, saw you at. It's, it's much deeper than that. I agree. Good comment. Anybody else? I'm thinking of a story. I read of a, a girl who was involved in an auto accident and received mortal injuries uh, 
survive long enough for the mother to arrive on the scene of the accident and then ask the mother, you know, you've taught me a lot of things about this world, you know, how not to get pregnant, how to look nice, how to get a career, how to go to school, which never taught me how to die. And uh, so that was really profound to me. Okay. Interesting point. Well, it's important to me because my wife passed away recently. So that's what I'm thinking about. All right. So as we continue. So the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. The light of his glory, his character, is to shine forth in his followers. Thus, they are to glorify God, to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, one of the things that's going on in this area, there is a group that, one that is, is really not part of this message, claimed to be early, but has not been. This, uh, this party's brought this, these, these others into this area. And these other people are now claiming that there is no Holy Spirit. Now, I read this. I read this passage. And again, through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. Now, if there is no Holy Spirit, how can those attributes be developed? They can't. Exactly. We need to have faith in the comforter that Christ has sent. We need to have faith in the word of God, which is Christ. But we also need to come to understand the character of God, which has been represented by Christ. Now, going back to the 10 virgins. Mrs. White writes, this is not a representation of open sinners, but of those who profess Christ of the members of the church. Is this referring only to the Seventh-day Adventist church? I think it's for all who profess Christ. Okay. I've but never thought of it. Pointing to us. Yeah, it, it especially points to us. Thank you, Angela. Patrick, you were saying? Yeah, I agree with Angela. I've never thought of it applying to other churches, always just to Adventism. Well, I'm, I'm looking at this, you know, very specifically. Because the Adventist church is not the only one who looks to present, profess Christ. True. Now, they have no oil in their vessels with which to replenish their lamps. They have not been faithful, but indifferent. Now, how many believe the gospel to be Christ loves you 
And all you have to do is believe on him and you will be saved, but not look upon the rest of what we have been shown throughout his ministry and by his life. So to read from the chat, good point. Those who yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit begin war with themselves, but those who cling to sin war against the truth and its representatives. Desire of Ages, chapter 31. So true. Thank you for that quote. Continuing on, they have made a pretense of waiting for their Lord. They have not watched and prayed, seeking for and securing that faith which works by love and purifies the soul. They have lived a life of carelessness. They have heard the truth, assented to the truth, but they have never brought it into their daily life. God has not one word of encouragement for those who, while favored with every opportunity and privilege for obtaining light and knowledge, are not doers of the word, who do not keep the commandments of God. Here she's being very specific. We need to be a doer of the word and we need to keep the commandments. Yes, and the faith that works by love. Okay. What does that do for us? should give us a, a new attitude about the world that we live in. Okay. Back to Christ object lessons. So the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. <coughs> By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. The light of his glory, his character, is to shine forth in his followers. Thus they are to glorify God, to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, the work that the Holy Spirit is to do on our behalf. We need our hearts to be open so that the Holy Spirit can dwell in them. But by implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. What kind of an analogy is this? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but I see us be, to become partakers of the divine nature, well, the attributes of God. We have, we have some, in, in another parable, we have some that are the stony ground, we have some that are the prepared ground, and we have some that are the pathway where the seed falls and never germinates. So, how can this, how can the Holy Spirit implant anything in our hearts unless we are willing to receive it? Amen. The soil of the heart.
When the truth is enthroned in the heart, it will awaken in the believer a train of thought that will arouse the conscience of decided act to decided action. It will adorn the character. The whole nature will be renewed because of the oil of grace is, is there. Great harm can be done by the open sinner who makes no profession of loving God and keeping his commandments. But this is not the class the parable represents. It represents those who claim to be children of God, but who do not practice it. These have not a burden for souls. They do not deny self. They do not lift the cross of Christ. They are seeking to have an enjoyable time with the world while claiming to be Christians. These souls wear a mask and do great harm to others. They refuse to yield to any authority and by their worldly principles while claiming to be church members and children of God, they seduce many. Children who are such in deed and in truth will live and work to restore the moral image of God in man. Yeah, so just Christ uh, Christians? Christians, yes. I saw, my, I, I saw my mistake in reading. Thank you, Stephen. Christians who are such in deed and in truth will live and work to restore the moral image of God in man. They will labor on Christ's side to convince men of every class that a consecrated life is a power for good, while sin results only in weakness and eternal ruin. Returning to Christ object lessons. The coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. The days of Noah and Lot are pictured the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. The scriptures pointing forward to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of, un of unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. His working is plainly revealed by the rapid increasing darkness, the multitudinous errors, heresies, and delusions of the last days. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people, it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. He causes the light to shine out of darkness, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. When the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. Genesis 1, 2 and 3. So in the night of spiritual darkness, God's word goes forth, let there be light. To his people he says, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Behold, says the scripture, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Isaiah 60, verse 2. We are in the evening of this earth's history. 
the night, the darkness of the night follows, but there is light coming. Amen. <clears throat> Just uh, an observation. Yes, please. And the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So um, this is after the close of probation. This is after the seven last plagues. Would you maybe get that idea where she's placing this here? Darkness. But then <coughs> she says, uh, Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for thy light has come. So it'll be obviously, we'll be very late in the day for that light to be applied you know, to the end, to just before Christ's coming. And then when you read Isaiah 60, it goes on to say, the Gentiles shall, shall come to your light. So this is speaking before the close of probation. So I'm just sort of... Uh, okay. This, so this coming of the bridegroom is at midnight. It's kind of... To me, it, it suggests it's not at the close of probation. It would be more of a... In, in that situation, Stephen, I'm, I'm in agreement with you because I see the shut door as the close of probation. Yes. So here we have this night. We have this very dark night. The door is not yet shut. So this is the time of the, the final message to the world. Now there are some other items that, that I've been led to study that have changed some of my long held opinions because I had, I had not delved into some of these studies before. And there's, there's one that, that we will look to share in the future right now. Uh, in, in the conversations with Theodore, we wanted to go further in this, in the parable of the 10 virgins. And in working to divide this story, to look at this completely, I would say that the evening of the earth's history is just before the close of probation that the night is also just before this close of probation and that when the, the bridegroom comes and the door is shut to the wedding feast, that that is the close of probation. As I've said in the past, I'm looking at this also as symbolism of the day of atonement as to how this could be applied on that day so that that gives a a, a little picture of of some of the other things that that i'm being led to study and that i'm i'm taking a look at Okay, reference right now in the chat is Isaiah 49, 6 and 23. So if we took a look at that quickly. Isaiah 49, 6, and he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And then verse 23, <clears throat> and kings shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet 
and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Amen. I'm thinking of the last, next to last clause in the paragraph you just read also. Okay. They will labor on Christ's side to convince men of every class that a consecrated life is a power for good. And so that's kind of like our commission to show that our lives consecrated for to God is a power for good in the world. It behooves us to have many social contacts. Okay. And so that we can demonstrate Christ's character as much as we can reveal it. Okay. The men of the world do not want the light of truth. And the class of religionists represented by the foolish virgins suit them. They are one in spirit with those who never let their light shine in words of truth and deeds of holiness. Men who are truly serving God will reveal their progression heavenward. Those who are serving God will help to serve him with the whole mind, heart, soul, and strength. Their vessels will be filled with oil. Now, when I read that, <clears throat> those who are serving God will help to serve him with the whole mind, the whole heart, the whole soul, and all strength. Could this statement also be a type of the messages of Revelation 14 and 18? They certainly have to connect. The uh, Matthew 20, Go ahead, sorry, please. No, Matthew go ahead. 22, 37 to 40 tells us what the, what the, what the two, I mean, it's the two greatest, greatest command, commandments, love God and love, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And to serve God, to love God with, with everything, with your whole being. That's what this passage reminds me of. Okay. The unconverted members of the church remain in character the same as before they claim to believe the truth. In the place of seeking to save souls that are ready to perish, they live for self. Their vessels are empty, and therefore they cannot keep their lamps replenished. To these Christ said, I know you not. You have not taken me as your counselor. You have not walked in the light of my word. You have worked your own way. You have not come under my yoke. Your light has been darkness. For you have walked in the light of the sparks of your own kindling. You have not used the sacred fire which comes from God. What kind of a reference is that? I think if it's made up. Made up and abide you, right? Yes. Yes, definitely. Quite an indictment. So do we wish to be seen as were Nadab and Abihu? God forbid. Mm -hmm. 
going back to Christ object lessons. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. <clears throat> so, if we're looking at Revelation 14, where do we see the character of God? I would say, especially in the first uh, angel's message. If it's in the first, is it not in all? It is, but it it's it has to be established. I think at the beginning, as we've been learning, if you don't okay. understand it and receive it in the first, you won't receive it in the second, the third. Okay. I mean, I've I've always had to look at the third angel's message as being a an invitation that we can learn more of the character of God. And this is a choice. We, we have a choice either to learn of God or to continue to accept that of the adversary. The warning of the mark of the beast is conversely an offer to accept the character of God. Yeah. Those who have oil in their vessels with their lamps will let their light so shine before men that they may see their good works and glorify their Father which is in heaven. Unconverted men who profess to be Christians and do not shine in good works only encourage the sinner to continue in his sin. And Christ says to them, I know you not, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 25, 12, and 7, 23. The only safety for any soul is in living in constant communion with God. This is represented by Zechariah in the symbol of the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. That which is good in our world should be stronger for our words for our presence, and the evil should be made to appear as it is. There is no virtue in calling good evil and evil good. Every one should feel that there should flow forth from him an influence for life, courage, hopefulness, and true healing. <clears throat> How many times do we encounter those that claim to be Christian? Oh, I'm, I'm so happy that Christ is coming. I can't stand to be in this earth another day. This is so hard. This is so difficult. But yes, I believe that Christ is coming. What kind of a witness is that? Does this offer those around us the kind of example where they want to partake of what Christ is offering? Excellent point. So, now... You speak directly to my experience. Since the death of my wife, I've been really suffering from depression. And it's hard to appear cheerful uh, under such circumstances. 
Well, I, but I realized the necessity. In, in this situation, I wasn't pointing a finger at you, brother. I was, you know, anytime that I do point a finger, I've also got four pointed right back at me. No, I didn't regard it as any kind of finger pointing. Okay, well, I'm I'm just wanting to make that point clear. In these in these kind of situations, I mean, I I have gotten to know many. I have a I have a friend of mine that called me up on on Sunday, and he was extremely abrupt with me on a situation. I drove out to his house later and we we had quite the conversation because he's going through some trials and he does not like being in the trials. It's hard when we have trials put upon us to remember that these trials are here for our own good. And that we are to praise God in everything. Did not Daniel's friends, when they were thrown into that fiery furnace, where they knew it was possible that they could be destroyed, where they watched the men that threw them in be destroyed, did they not praise God the entire time they were in that fire? No doubt. They knew they, knew they were doing God's will. They knew it. Exactly. So as, as they understood that they were in God's will, no matter what happened, they were willing to praise God. Even if it meant their death, they praised God. You know, what was interesting is that they told the king the very, that very thing as well. Exactly true. <clears throat> now, this, this second document that should be up in front of you. On the parable of the ten virgins from June 29th of 1899. This was published first in Present Truth in the United Kingdom. And then was republished in the Review and Herald on the 31st of October of 1899. Now, <clears throat> we're going to continue with Christ Object Lessons, but we're also going to read through part of this document. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. This is the work outlined by the prophet Isaiah in the words, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice and strength, lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. Isaiah 40, 9 and 10. <clears throat> Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold your God. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the sun of righteousness 
is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. We are to be representatives of the character of Christ, which was representative of the character of God. Coming back to this document, when the ten virgins went forth to meet the bridegroom, their lamps were trimmed and burning. Apparently, there was no difference between the five who were wise and the five who were foolish. The outward appearance, all were prepared, robed in white and carrying their lighted lamps. But only five of these virgins were wise. These anticipated delay and filled their flagons with oil ready for any emergency. Five of the number had not this foresight, and they made no provision for the disappointment or delay. All the virgins are waiting for the bridegroom. Hour after hour passes, and they are still anxiously looking for his appearing. But at last, the weary, watchful ones fall asleep. And at midnight, the darkest hour, when their lamps are the most needed, the cry is heard. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. At the call, the sleeping eyes are opened, and everyone is aroused. They see the procession they are about to join moving on. Bright with torches and glad with music, they hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The five wise virgins trim their lamps and go forth to meet the bridegroom. So as, as this was presenting, they heard the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. They are now joined in unity. As was being pointed out, we need to come into unity. I don't know that that means that we're going to have every point, that we're going to be in agreement on everything, but we should be able to find common ground. We should be able to find those areas where we are in agreement with our brothers and our sisters so that we can work together. Amen. Agreed. The foolish virgins made no provision for their lamps. And when aroused from their slumbers, they found that their lights were going out. They now see the consequences of their carelessness and plead with their companions for a supply of oil. Give us of your oil, they say, for our lamps are gone out. But the waiting five with their freshly trimmed lamps have emptied their vessels. <clears throat> they have no oil, no oil to spare. And they answer, no, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. But while they went to buy, the procession moved on <clears throat> and left them behind. The bridal train entered the house, and the door was shut. When the foolish virgins reached the banqueting hall, they received an unexpected denial. They were left outside in the blackness of the night. This parable. I'm thinking of comparing. Excuse me. No, go ahead, please. Thinking of comparing the the oil <clears throat> to the gathering of the manna every morning for each individual for themselves. Okay. <clears throat> so you would be you would be thinking that the manna would be comparing that this would be comparable of of character. Yes, and 
uh, well, you know, we we gather our manna by connecting spiritually with the Lord every day, and uh, we don't we weren't told to build up a supply of manna, but to gather it every day. When we apply that to oil, it, it does actually build up as a reserve. Just a thought. Okay. <clears throat> This parable is not a representation of open sinners, but of those who profess Christ. The bride is the church who is waiting for the second appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the proclamation of the first and second angels of Revelation 14, a special message has come to our world. Speaking of these messages, John says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, and saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So, is she saying that the special message here is the first and second angel's message, or is she calling all three that special message? As we continue, the first and second angel's messages are united and made complete in the third. John says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Under the proclamation of these messages, the cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. The believers in these messages were compelled to go out from the churches because they preach the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. The whole world was made to hear the message, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Many who heard these messages thought they would live to see Christ come, but there was a delay in the coming of the bridegroom in order that all might have an opportunity to hear that last message of mercy to a fallen world. <clears throat> Had those who proclaimed, who claimed to believe the truth, acted their part as wise virgins, the message would ere this have been given to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But five were foolish. The truth should have been proclaimed by the ten virgins, but only five had made the provision essential to join that company who walked in the light that has come to them. Remember, she's writing this in 1899. Had those who, who claimed to believe the truth acted their part. We don't want to hear this kind of condemnation today. We don't want to see this kind of condemnation today. So, the first, second, and third angels' messages are to be repeated.
the call first is and second excuse me the first and second open the way for the proclamation of the third but here again and she's she's being very direct in saying that these are all to be repeated correct yes yes correct and it seems like she's referring back to the 1888 problem where I, they were rejected. I, I would call that more than just a problem. I would, I would have called it the debacle of 1888. Granted. The call is to be given to the church. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Come out of her my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Revelation 18, 2 to 5, but we should also be looking at Isaiah 52, 11, along with Matthew 24, 15 and 16. Now, this call that's given to the church is being given as a warning to those that profess Christ. The open sinners are stony ground. They are receiving the light they are seeing the benefits of the light, but they choose not to accept the light. May that not be said about us. Amen. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the messages of the first and the second angels refused the third, the last testing message to be given to the world. And a similar position will be taken when the last call is made. <clears throat> Here, as she wrote this 122 years ago, this is being outlined clearly for us that we can see the failure of the past so that we can avoid the same failure today. <clears throat> Every specification of this parable should be carefully studied. We are represented either by the wise or by the foolish virgins. So is this another way of saying that we have here, we have two classes. Yeah. There are many who will not remain at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. <clears throat> That's one of the things that, that Mary of Bethany did routinely was to remain at the feet of Jesus. The same was not said of Shimon, the same was not said of Martha, but it was said consistently about Mary. They have not a knowledge of his ways. They are not prepared for his coming. They have made a pretense of waiting for their Lord. They have not watched and prayed that faith which works by love and purifies the soul. They have lived a life of carelessness 
they have heard and assented to the truth, but they have never brought it into their practical life. The oil of grace is not feeding their lamps. And they are not prepared to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. The oil is the holy grace that is sent from heaven. And there must be an inward adorning with that grace if we would stand when he appeareth. The men of the world do not. Amen. Okay. The men of the world do not want the light of truth. And they are one in spirit with those who, while professing to be the children of God, do not let their light shine in words of truth and deeds of holiness. Unconverted men who claim to be Christians only encourage the sinner to continue in his sin. In the place of seeking to save the souls that are ready to perish, they live for self. Their vessels are empty, and therefore they cannot keep their lamps replenished. To those Christ says, I know you not. You have not taken me as your counselor. You have not walked in the light of my word. You have not come under my yoke. Your light is darkness, because you have walked in the sparks of the fire of your own kindling. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Here again, she's giving the same warning in the same words. You know, um, I like the phrase she uses. I've heard this before about walking in the sparks of your own, of your own imaginings or doings. Your own kindling, yes. Kindling. I tell you, to me, that really describes the, the, uh, the vast amount of, of um, relativism going on in our world and in our and in how it affects our own lives and everything. Well, is this also not when when we have those of pleasing address that choose to speak more of not from scripture, but from conjecture. I can see the application. Yes. So if, if we are going to be as the Jews were, that we seek our faith based upon the words of men rather than the words of God, then are we not walking in the sparks of the fire of our own kindling rather than that of that it, that has been sent to us by God? Agreed. Amen. There's many commentators and self-help books and good advice givers out there. Uh, make posters and memes i see them on facebook a lot but it's all about lifting ourselves up okay rather than trusting in god and appealing to jesus for help or somewhere in between jesus and ourselves right and we cannot afford to have anything in between christ and ourselves Yes, yes. We are not to rest in the idea that because we are church members, we are saved. While we give no evidence that we are conformed to the image of Christ, while we cling to our old habits and weave our fabric with the thread of worldly ideas and customs. Christ declares, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, here again, Christ said this, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, but we can also find references on this in Matthew 25, 41, and in Luke 13, 2 through 27. This representation should call forth our earnest study in order that we may know what preparation to make that we may enter in and partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Revelation 22, 14. It's a warning to those who seem to do many mighty and wonderful works in the Lord's name. Years ago, in having a conversation with an old friend, she asked the question, why we're not able to see the healing that was done at the time of Christ, why we were not able to see the mighty works. And her comment, her assumption was that we don't have the right message. Yet, as Mrs. White has written, when the church is pure, all of the gifts of the spirit will be evident. We are coming rapidly onto a point where the church needs to be prepared for the purification. But the only way it can be purified is if our characters are in line with that of Christ's. Yes. <clears throat> the ten yeah. virgins. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse and me. <clears throat> so sorry. We have to realize that we can't be looking at others, meaning the church or whoever is, com is comprising the church. We have to look at ourselves and be pure. Are we ready? We have to realize that the Lord is willing to do a mighty work within each of us, and we need to just let him do it. And that's what I'm learning more and more. That's why the, this these fiery trials, and now I'm grateful for them. You know, and, and I know that it was such a test, and I could just perceive without seeing it, but sensing it, that the devil and his hordes and the angels, the, fa the unfallen beings were watching to see what choice I would make. And I choose life. I choose him. I have to look to him because I'm a wreck. You know, it's got to be him that's going to pull me through. Amen. Amen. The disciples, after Christ returned to his father's courts, the disciples met in the upper room confessing and praying and examining their characters and all of this took forth that this all of this took place before what we now call pentecost is this not the position that we need to find ourselves in today before the final outpouring of the Spirit of God? Yes. Are we not to come into unity with one another? Amen. Yes. The ten virgins are watching in the evening of Earth's history. All claim to be Christians. All have a call, a name, a lamp, and all claim to be doing God's service. All apparently watch for his appearing, but five are wanting. Five will be found surprised, dismayed outside the banquet hall. 
There are many who cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace. This is the most perilous belief that the human soul can entertain. Christ calls upon all who bear his name, who claim to be his followers, to eat his flesh and drink his blood, or they can have no part with him. His words, eating and drinking his words daily. Exactly. Be not like the foolish virgins who have taken for granted the promises of God are theirs, while they do not follow the injunctions of Christ. Christ teaches us that profession is nothing. He that will come after me, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9.23, but also referenced in Matthew 16, Mark 8, John 12, and Romans 8.13. Whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Does that mean that you can, you can break even one commandment and, and be of the kingdom of heaven? No, no way. Mm -hmm. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. When we stand the test of God in the refining, purifying process, when the furnace fire consumes the dross and the true gold of a purified character appears, we may still say with Paul, though not, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. <clears throat> there are many points that Mrs. White brings out about this parable. One of the things that I've also taken away from the lessons that Elder Daniel has been teaching has been that many of these parables are paired with another parable so that we may more clearly understand the points that are being made. Yes. So in this, in these three documents, Christ Object Lessons and the, these two documents that we've read today. There are points that are addressed in one but not addressed in another. There are little bits that Mrs. White brings out very clearly in one area, but not so clearly in the other but they're all complementary so that we can work as we study to understand exactly what is being presented. This is what I'm coming to understand is part of the admonition that we need to search the scriptures as a minor looking for gold or for precious gems. <clears throat> and it's with this thought that I will leave you for today. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you, Dwayne. Okay, so shall we close with prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father, there are many things that we yet need to understand for we. We see this 
yet not perfectly. We need for your spirit to guide us and to direct us in all that we should be doing so that it is your character that others may see. Help us now, Father, guide us through this day. Direct us where you would have us to walk. Show us that which you would have us to do. Be with us each today as we are separated one from another. Be with Theodore and Heidi as, as they are working on their garden. Direct us now as we go forward. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.